Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time you are listening to this podcast. My name is James Albarn and this is The Last Line. I hope you're all having a wonderful week. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're new to the show, then please do hit subscribe on iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Follow us on Spotify and all the other podcast services that this is available on. If you're feeling extra generous, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash the last line and give me some of your money. Uh, It would be very much appreciated and would help the podcast keep going on and on and on. As you'll notice, we were a week late. If you didn't notice that, then why aren't you paying attention? You should be keeping up to date with the podcast at last line podcast on Instagram. Go there at the last line podcast on Instagram. You can keep up to date with all the goings on with the show um, and look at some lovely pictures of the guests. This week, I speak to two time world superbike champion and lead singer of Toesland, James Toesland. Uh, James was the world superbike champion in 2004 and 2007 before a wrist injury sustained in 2011 ended his superbike career early. After retiring, James returned to his first love of music and now fronts the rock band Toesland, who have released two albums to date, Renegade and Cradle the Rage. At meeting at the pub at the end of the road we both live on, we mainly focus on what it's like to have to stop doing something you love and begin a whole new life. Sports people and like motorbike races and racing driving stuff, you kind of spend a lot of time, you know, and hard work building up to a career that then is, even if you don't retire early, is quite short. Yep. And I was just sort of wondering what it was like, especially for you, because your career was cut short, yeah. particularly early, mm. what that's like and then where that leaves you afterwards and sort of how Ooh, you move on okay. <laughs> That's a big question. I might need to another side before we <laughs> <Yeah>. start that. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there's a, there's a few there's a few emotions that um, um, that you are uh, um, uh, have to go through when um, when forced to retire or or retire just through a natural age thing because um, um, a few a couple of years after I had to retire I was having a, a chat with a couple of other riders um, that retired just to age and uh, that really helped me in a weird way because. Um, um, I don't think they'll mind me saying, but the riders were Troy Bayliss and Max Biaggi, who were um, who were very, very successful riders in their own in their own right. And they were chatting about, and the subject came up about how you how you coping. And it's not really something uh, that you don't pose the question, especially at a paddock as well, when it's a very kind of competitive um, uh, environment, the way you don't want to show any weakness, mm. and. Uh, when the question came up, I was quite surprised that it did in that environment. It wasn't away from the track in a hotel or something. It was right. at the track. And, um, and Troy and Max just started uh, going quite deep into um, how difficult they were finding life. Um, and, I, and I thought I'd always got the worst um, end of the stick on having to retire through an injury 10 years before they did. Yeah. Um, they were 40, I was 30, or 32 and 42, because it was a couple of years after we'd, we'd all retired. And, um, and it was it was incredible to hear just how difficult their life was, which then made me think, wow, whether I'd been forced to retire now or had another 10 years, I'd still be in the same situation. It would still, yeah, it would still hurt as much. Yeah. yeah. If not if not more, because their bodies were fine-ish, they're just going to be old. Yeah. Their minds were fine, and their, and, and their minds and hearts were still fast and competitive where I'd got an injury to my wrist which it completely stopped it wasn't the worst injury I'd had but to not be able to bend your wrist there was there was no if buts or maybes that was it you know uh, and I quickly knew that and the decision for me was what's going to be more difficult finishing 10th or finishing and I had 
I made that decision in one and a half races because I did try and come back. Yeah. And uh, I, I knew that that was it, you know, because I knew that finishing tenth was going to be more frustrating and more damaging for my life than it would be. Uh, um, it would be finishing completely. Right. So that couple of years after that kind of like gave me a, a bit of um, um, a bit of a new perspective on it. And and all along the way, you've just got to find things that. Um, Give you a slap around the face and have a, have a realization of just how fortunate you were to even have it right and i think that the biggest savior for myself is the saying that i would have rather have had and lost than to never have had and if i get in a bit of a dark place every now and again um, um you know that's the saying i give myself um uh, quite frequently uh, and uh, but if if you are competitive to that level where you get to world championships no matter what you do you're gonna have a battle yeah regardless when you finish whether you finish through injury or whether you finish through age i saw a really good documentary about federer and nadal only a couple of weeks ago and john mcenroe was on there and even with all his successes he says all i've done for 25 years is cope with what i did wrong right <laughs> intro that's interesting yeah and it was and he's like a legend and you know and the way the way the documentary was put together it was a very good documentary. Um, I think it was BBC Two just before because it was a build up to the Wimbledon yeah. event. And, and it was like ten years since that final of Federer and Nadal, wasn't it? The, yeah, the big. Yeah, but you could hear in John McEnroe's voice. God, he'd have to fight and battle those chemicals in his head for whatever reason. However, he's finished and, and retired. Uh, through age or, uh, or injury, um, the way that sportsmen tick is, is you, we want to do better, we want to be better every single day. And even when we don't even compete in the sport that we, uh, we, uh, we had an excuse to be that way, <laughs> mm. and we filtered all that energy into it, and whatever we did um, kind of scratched the itch of that obsessiveness. Um, and uh, well, the way you said, yeah, for 25 years I've just been uh, battling uh, um, for all my mistakes. It was like, oh God, how can somebody so successful and so revered and so admired live day to day um, in that kind of state? Yeah. You know, all his fans and everybody that looks at him, and if I bumped into him, people are like, oh, bloody hell, respect, mate, you know. Um, and my, my kind of, uh, um, you know, the way I foresee people like that you know with men hearing what actually they look at themselves like can be complete you know you know black and white it's, mm. um, it, it's surprising and, the, and this is these are the uh, the things that you got to cope with and deal with but when you're doing it you see your life is so 100 mile an hour and um, the focus and you're very very lucky to have such a, a goal to achieve every time you wake up I was lucky enough every time I woke up and if I did the best I could that day, I was possibly going to be a world champion. You can't underestimate just what, um, uh, just what a life that gives you as, as far as, you know. Can you imagine waking up with that, um, with that possibility in front yeah. of you and how amazing everything is and everything that, that brings and success brings, you know, with the money and the girls and the, the lifestyle and the, whatever it is. You're on a you're on a you're on a really fast treadmill there, yeah. Um, and you start so early now as a sportsman or any profession really, but you don't know anything different. What age were you when you started riding? Nine years old, I got my first motorcycle. Right. And then I was professional at 16. I was pretty early for my day really. I was because you weren't allowed to ride a motorcycle on the racetrack at 600s um, until 18, but they actually changed the rules for me. So obviously I um, I got a bit of natural talent at it and to be that good that early kind of thing um, uh, but because like you know these kids are doing it now at like 11 12 yeah so that's all the kind of the life that you know and I think it's going to be even worse for people like sportsmen and people um, in this era now because I had a bit of normal life going on for just enough time mm. to um, to really appreciate it, and when I came home and I got still my school friends, and I still I got all my friends at school and still at home and in Sheffield. So every time I really did look forward to coming back and getting back into that normality routine. Whereas if you are on that treadmill at eleven, 
your reality can be on that next level. Yeah. Um, a normal life compared to that life uh, is, uh, is, is they're, they're too big a differences mm. and that's why it's difficult to, when it goes when it disappears either through force with injury or through uh, later life um, just through age or whatever you still haven't had that core of what's real yeah you know and uh, and that and that basis and that foundations of, of a uh, of, of that family friends where you grew up kind of uh, uh, catch net really um, just for anyone who's listening that might not know what uh, what was your injury basically how what how did it happen and what I fell off in Spain in Aragon in 2011 I think it was March 2011 it wasn't the biggest crash I'd had but unfortunately I, I hit the ground with my hand and uh, the, 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 the wrist rolled over so severely that uh, it dislocated the bone so badly that all the bones were overlapped each other um, and you know, I'd had a great surgeon, wrist surgeon, and, and he put them all back into place and pinned it all mm. for uh, about three months. Uh, and then he said that it was so badly damaged in there, he was fingers crossed, but it was it was a mess. Uh, and it was a bit like Jenga. Then after three months, he pulled the pins out, and hopefully the bones would have stayed in the place that they needed to. But unfortunately, the, the damage was so bad that the bones just slipped uh, down in a few places and, and, and ended up with you no know, movement. And, which is pretty key when you <laughs> race racing motorbikes. That was isn't it? it, yeah, yeah. And uh, I had physio for months, but the pain was going away a bit, and, and and the strength was coming back a bit. But I kept waking up every morning, and it would not bend. And like, yeah, it, it took ages for the uh, for me to accept that nothing else could be done. You know, it was horrible, horrible time, because it was such like it wasn't overly painful, it wasn't overly awkward. Right. But if I couldn't bend it, I knew I was. I knew I was done. Yeah. And that was that was difficult to take. Is it still bad now? Can you bend it now? Or? No, no. I mean, it's not very good for the older. <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah, you can't uh, just, just move that. You can't just, move just, that at all, Just, just can you? Listed. No, it's yeah. not very good, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I, to be honest, I mean, yeah, it, it's been about that since, ever since, uh, since getting the pins out. But then... Uh, after I retired, um, it, uh, the arthritic pain because uh, the bones were really um, grinding together quite badly. Yeah. Um, I, I then I, I decided to have a partial fuse on right. it to take the bones away from each other just because it was like it was like a broken wrist every day. So I've had four screws in there now, and um, it's a little bit better. But I, I might have to have a full fuse because it's uh, it's a bit awkward. Um, each, right. Each day, so but we'll see. We'll see. So you're talking about your waking up every morning the possibility of you being a world champion and you said that's amazing which it does sound amazing <laughs> also at the same time it sounds like like horrible pressure <laughs> was that something that you noticed um, or, or was it just it, is it, it just great it, it's a lot of, it is a lot of pressure but um uh if you have the talent and you have the um uh the passion and the dedication and the love for what you do. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to work with good teams, good bikes, good engineers, good management, where um, I knew there was a, it was it was well within reach to achieve that. Right. I think where it, it could get a little bit stressful um, is if, um, uh, is if, your goals get with out of reach. That's when it starts to um, uh, get a little bit pressured. Right. Day to day. Yeah. Uh, but um, but throughout my career, luckily, um, because I always kept focused and they always kept it. And if you keep if you keep on a good on a good track and, and you and you and you look after yourself and you train every day and, and you don't do the, and you do the right things. Um, if you have got that natural talent, then and you know the tracks. If you know all the circuits, uh, it's experience a lot of it. If you know every single corner of every single track on the World Championship, yeah, um, you've got to experience with the bikes and the teams and, and what's changed on the bike. Well, once you've got those ingredients, it's not that difficult to keep it going, right? Like most things. Yeah. You know, once you've studied and, and learned what your skills are, you're locked in, and you're locked that, in. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Next up to you, just to keep the consistency. It's just uh, it becomes becomes like you know, you don't even think about exactly. it. I suppose, yeah. Exactly. And once you get to that level. 
And once, you, once those things start to be all subconscious, uh, then you can do great things then. Because, you know, if, if you're learning the track, if you're learning the bike, it's a new bike. If, you, if your chief engineer is not really familiar with your Yorkshire accent and he's struggling to understand what you want to do with the bike and stuff like that, then, it, um, you know, um, as the old saying goes, shit rolls downhill, you know. Right. So, and if you're pushing did, it up, and did you have those problems with? Oh, always, <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you came, but, but, um, but, you know, it wasn't too difficult to get back to where you needed to be um, uh, once all those things yeah. came into place. Um, I suppose, in a way, that's it's when you were just saying about how you just you learn it and you know it, you lock it in. And then it becomes second nature. I guess that's in a way that's a bit like music as well, isn't it? I suppose when yeah. you're performing, it's yep. Yeah, once you've the learned the instrument, sort of, yeah. Once you've learned your stage stagecraft, once you've come comfortable about yourself. I mean, music is is a different ball game because everybody's looking straight at you. Yeah. And there's different pressures to that, um, especially with new music that aren't, isn't familiar to to them. They they're listening. They're, they're wondering what your story is. They're wondering what your song's about. And they're wondering, um, you know, some people are just there to see because uh, they, they love the musician side of it. They're a guitarist, and I've got a great guitarist or a drummer or whatever it may be. But some people might be there because they've known me for a long time for them sporting their music. And, um, they're wondering what I'm doing still, being on stage with a message to tell, with a show to do. Yeah. Um, so with art, it's very difficult to pinpoint um, why people like it. You know, with motorcycle, with sports, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Cross the line first. <laughs> I really loved it. Yeah. Cross the line six. Everybody was wondering what's happening. Um, but it was so easy to judge about where you're at. Yeah. And with music and on stage, and um, it's 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 a different ball game. That's more difficult. Um, but it, it's more for your it's more for yourself. Um, in fact, not for me. I, I said I was going to say it's more for myself. Uh, what I want to do in life. But actually, it's not. Actually, I'm, I always wanted to race motorcycles really fast, and luckily I got good enough where a lot of people watched it, and I got to the successes that I had. And the the, the music, the band, it's been really difficult to. The most difficult thing is starting again, because you forget how much work you've put in to get good. Right. Yeah. And when you're on that treadmill, when you know everything and everything's just like subconscious, and that, that's a long time of that period, and you forget where the, what the grind was like. And to grind again to uh, uh, to start another career. Yeah. Um, has, that's been that's been probably one of the toughest things. Whilst you're recovering from having to retire. Yeah. That was um, there was a few uh, few bleak moments. Yeah, you didn't pick the the easiest industry to then <laughs> jump no. into, did you? Really? No, no. I mean, if if age didn't matter, it would have been easy to do the band and, and do the music. Um, and then uh, and then jump on a motorbike and um, and go fast and go fast because you could judge where you're at. Yeah. With music, it was very even though I thought I'd done some really good songs and lyrics and blah blah blah, uh, it was really difficult to uh, to judge um, where you're at with it and the progression of it, the speed of pro progression. I mean, it, 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 we've had a a great um, a great start. I mean, seven years now, but um, two albums in and uh, it's a. Uh, we're just doing this uh, songs for the third album now, and it's um, it's all to play for. But uh, but yeah, but you, you, uh, as well, you know, 37, 38 this year now as well, and um, the travelling, the touring, driving a van everywhere. With seven lads, travel lodge hotels. Mm. Um, it's the grind. Yeah. Um, and like. You know, it's been a long time since I was in travel lodge hotels or a caravan with motorcycle racing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, and the way I used to travel and the way I used to race, and the lifestyle I used to have when the level I got, well, um, it was a long time since I saw a travel lodge room. <laughs> 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 but it's you find out what you, you find out what your passions are then. Yeah. And you find out what, you know, why you really do do stuff, and um, and that's why I don't mind it because it's, uh, it's always been a passion of mine. I learned the piano before I learned how to ride a motorcycle. And when I had to retire from racing, that was the only thing, other thing I knew how to do. And, uh, and I felt I was good enough to give it a shot um, on, on having another profession, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I wasn't much good at it, else. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, the gr yeah, because the grind, you know, you, you, you do it 
it, it's not a, it's not really a grind if you if you you know if you really want to do it yes and that's something I've probably learned um, you know since leaving film school and stuff you you realize you, you realize by default in a way what you what things you want to push yourself in more because you you don't worry about spending time with it. It's not a, yep. an effort to, and you you sort of naturally just fall into. I think, well, not everyone, but I think yep. naturally I've fallen into the stuff that I care most about. Yep. In doing. If you enjoy the grind, you're in the right gig. Yeah. That's when you know you're you're doing what you enjoy. Yeah. Cleaning your motorbike at the end of the day when you've been motocrossing. Cleaning your gear, washing your boots off. I mean, I'm talking as a kid here when your mum was telling you to. I had to be forced a little bit, but. Still wasn't a problem because if I did that, I knew I'd be back on the bike again. Yeah, and I, that was all what it was all about. And one day, someone will be being paid to clean your motor. Well, well, yeah, you know that at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, with the van, you know, driving the van, book, booking the hotels, booking, um, getting the lads sorted out, um, checking in at half one, two o'clock in in, in in the in the snow, uh, and getting the bags out. And, Loading in, loading now, yeah. sound checking. Um, all of the things are very, very difficult in the band. Um, I'm still doing something that I'm passionate about. And I love doing. Yeah. So, um, but the problem is, is um, uh, that's my brother there. Yeah. The problem is, is um, uh, when you get older, um, you need your lifestyle to still accom- be able to accommodate being being so selfish right to to be so uh, um, determined to achieve something um, means that, uh, that not a lot of people get much attention around yeah. it. Is that a tricky balance to, to yeah. get right uh, it hasn't it hasn't really I mean I'm lucky because the missus does it as well yeah. yeah she's a musician as well so she knows the gig she knows what happens she knows she's what got we the need understanding to do. of yeah. yeah so you know she knows what I need to do to, to make a success of this. Um, I mean, um, she's uh, she's she's had a music career like my music career was. I was 16 years old, doing pretty good, and the world championship team took me on because I got so I'd got something that they saw that, that then all of a sudden I was getting paid to ride a motorcycle and someone was cleaning me cleaning me the bike and doing it all for me. Yeah. And she was the same. She went to she went to Brit school and and, and Mike Bat went there wanting someone um, like an Eva Cassidy. Because Eva Cassidy had just gone massive um, um, after a death, unfortunately. Um, and Kate Winfin for the audition. Mike was there. He'd already got the most of the songs for the first album that they did together already, already there, and, and boom. Mm. Yeah, she was like the biggest thing for. In at 18 years old, in yeah. three months, I think she was doing Wembley. Yeah. And the journey that I've had in music, the traditional way of playing the clubs. You know, driving around, loading in, gigging, non-stop, supporting people. Um, I've had some, some amazing supports, but you know, uh, when you're supporting, sometimes like right, get your stuff on, get do your thing, get off before we come because they're you know, yeah. and their audience as well. And you've got to go out in front of an audience that's paid to not see you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered that actually about about being a sport act. Like, what is that like? Go, like you said, going out seeing a audience that aren't there to see you they're they're literally just waiting for and sometimes you go to a gig and and you do find a support act that you really you end up really loving sometimes more than the person that you've gone to see yeah but um it must be a tough gig it is a tough gig but it's all about your confidence in what you do um and having that kind of uh, um um if you think about it too much, then then that can 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 do your head in. Drive you um, mad, yeah, yeah. drive mad. Yeah. Especially backstage just before you go on. You're like, look, you know, we're very proud of what we do. Um, the love of musicianship that I've got in the band, and, and the songs. The songs is the most important thing. And if you're confident with the songs and yeah. what your message is, um, it, it doesn't matter what what anybody thinks really. If you're really confident and. and um, in what you've written uh, as, as, as a piece of music uh, uh, and as a song, then it's um, it's all right, actually. The, the toughest ones are if you support really big acts. I mean, we support Deep Purple, um, and um, and that, that was that an was amazing experience. And Ian Gillen was, was amazing to us, because 
I didn't realise he sponsored a motorcycle team when he was younger. <laughs> so he realised, he saw the name, and not until we'd done the first show, he saw the name, and he says, oh, he said to the management, I says, oh, I used to know <laughs> I used to make motorbikes with that name. <laughs> and he says, yeah, it's him. <laughs> and then after that, in the dressing room, sharing the hospitality, and, you know, and the first show was like, right, it's still for gate off, right, and yeah. I want to see you, you know. And, and so that, that, was a, that was a great experience once he kind of, like, realised um, who I was, you know, with the history of, um, um, uh, with what he'd done as well, because um, there was a few big musicians that used to enjoy motorcycle racing. Um, there was uh, Martin Offler from the oh, Straits. Yeah. He sponsored a, a race team when I was racing at 16. Really? In the paddock. Really? And he was knocking around. Um, Keith Flint from right. Pro I think he still rides. And he, he actually runs his own team. Really? Yeah, he's actually a team manager um, in, uh, in the British Championship 600 <laughs> Um So there's some close connections there. Um, but the bigger the band that you support, the more kind of um, the, the, the crowd generally you, they, they don't go to too many shows. Right. That's, it's just yeah. because Deep Purple are coming on, just because Guns N' Roses are sure. coming on, whatever. Um, and when you go out in front of those crowds, you, you can see like, oh, you know, we've come to see Deep Purple, not you guys. And you know, if you could just uh, you know jog on, because you know. Yeah. But, um, but they were really warm. The crowd was really warm to us, and, and it was a great tour that we had in Italy, in, in uh, Italy, in Germany. Um, but we support like Black Sun Cherry and a couple of others in in venues that were just a little bit bigger than us. And they're the they're, they're, I think they're more important to you as a, as a new band up and coming because those people do go to the clubs. Yeah, they're um, interested in new music. And, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they did more for us actually. Well, I'll say that, but um, don't say they did more for us than, than the kind of really big shows like Deep Purple. But um, uh, you, you could feel you could feel that the audience was used to seeing new music uh, and, and, uh, and listening, appreciating new music compared to just the big bands. Right. It's, um, it's, it's been an experience point. Yeah. Oh, we did uh, Status Quo when they got back together. Um, that was a that was a good tour because they, they the original band got back together again before obviously they passed away. Yeah. Um, and that was really good because um, it, the original band got together again, uh, all the crowd came in really early to get to the front to see them. Right, so you had, so a, it was full yeah, yeah, you had a great crowd. Yeah. Full yeah. House, yeah. So it's just little things like that yeah. you know, can, can help me out. You know, but um, but uh, it's, it's been an experience. Learning a new um, uh, industry, um, learning how to do it and, and what to do, and what to say on stage. And, with a bit of a stigma, obviously, with who I was and what I used to do quite a bit. Uh, it's not been easy to shake that off in a few areas. Right. You know, a couple of the publications. I mean, uh, what's, uh, are people a bit snooty about it then? Is it like, oh, it's this guy who's right. One review said uh, the former Grease Monkey does his second album. Right. <laughs> and that was a big publication. Yeah. Um, I mean, the former Grease Monkey, I mean, I'll take anything, but I'll, I'll not. I'll not take slagging off of what I used to do. Yeah. You know, I did win two world championships for this country, and you. you and it was something you cared deeply about, and yeah. and also what <laughs> what's wrong with being a motorbike racer? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's there's that as well. But um, so and I and I and I told him so as well. Um, um, and I, and I said to a couple of them, I said, look, if you if you can't accept me doing. I'm coming into your world uh, from what I used to do. Um, I don't mind you not covering the band at all. Yeah. You know? um, but, uh, but but don't write derogative things um, uh, about who I used to be because um, I, I, I did well at that. Yeah. That was a lot of work, a lot of effort. So if you don't like the music for what, for that reason, then don't write anything because don't slag my music off for what I used to do. It's also it's not it's also it's just also not a valid criticism, is it? You can't. It's, you're not. They're not being objective about the music. They're no. instantly judging it because no, I'm Grease Monkey. Yeah. You know, you're getting close to. Um, you know. Yeah. A slap. Serious listener. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. So it was. Uh, so I've had a bit of that as well. Right. But I, I expected that. You know, I expected uh, the rock and roll world, especially the rock and roll world, because the rock world are pretty unforgiving. You know, they, they know what they like. 
Yeah. Um, and um, but I was prepared for that because I've lived up that I've lived that way, you know. Um, motorcycle racing and rock and roll live quite closely together, you know. With each yeah. other, so. um, but on a whole, on a whole, it's uh, it's been it's been a nice little journey. Yeah, I, I read uh, an article, I think it was like a GQ article or something, like an interview with you, it's from years ago. But you, it, you said in it that you'd spent eight months living in a hotel writing mm. songs. Yeah. And I just wondered why you, what, uh, was that to get, was that just to get away from everything and focus on solely no. on one thing or? No, that was, uh, the songwriter living in Scarborough uh, where, that I collaborated with, Toby Jepson. Um, and I knew, and, and, it, and, it, and it terrified me without having the material, yeah. without having the album. My new life was never going to start. Right. So I shortcutted the time what it took to write 11 songs. By just album, going up there and staying, staying there. there. Yeah. That, that was it. I mean, obviously. To write an album, we, we, we probably had 30 ideas. Obviously, we had to narrow it down to 11. But yeah, yeah. But that was the um, yeah that, that, that was a reason for for stopping that hotel for so long. Uh, okay, because it read I think it read in the article slightly darker than the reason maybe was. Uh, I can't remember the yeah, exact yeah, yeah, wording yeah, yeah. of it. But yeah, but it, it was a it, oh God, it was a difficult time. I was in a, I was in a real shit. I was in a bad place uh, by not being able to write anymore. Yeah, and the music was a passion for me. It always has been. But if someone could have said at that point in time in those eight months, or even now, I'll sort of can sort your wrist out tomorrow. You can bend again, you, you know, it'll be all right. You'd go and do it again if you had to. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I'll be tempted. It'd be a difficult to Yeah, because that's how I tick, you know, that's how yeah. I tick. And that's what I was good at. Do you still ride then, like casually, or? I, is, that, is that because, is that solely because of the wrist, or also because you just don't want to? A little bit for the wrist, because it is painful. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm holding tightly onto something. Uh, because of the bone, because of the screws in there. Yeah. Uh, but it, it was mainly, I had to go cold turkey on it. Because it was, I didn't ride a motorbike anymore that, like I used to. Yeah. And the only time I really, really enjoyed it was, was when, when I couldn't bend my wrist. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden motorcycling wasn't, it wasn't fun anymore. Which was a big, uh, uh, and I didn't, I didn't, I, I never thought I would ever feel that way about riding a motorbike. Yeah, well, that did it to me, you know. So that was that. Um, so I, I don't know whether over these years, over these seven years, I've, I've, I've always been asking myself: is, is that the best way to do it? Right. Not riding at all. To move on and to start a new life and um, and to uh, to cope with it. And I'm not sure. Some days. I feel like it's. I feel like it's a pretty common thing. I feel like most people probably do the same thing as you. I mean, I have no evidence to back that up, but like, it's what I probably would have expected you to say. Is it? You don't. Yeah. I mean, I've just been watching on TV this weekend. My old uh, nemesis, um, Troy Bailey, who was yeah. in a conversation with Max Biaggi. He's had to go back racing again, and he's racing in Australia because he's Australian. Right. And he's just won the national race. Just won. Yeah. He's 49 years old. Yeah. And he's still winning the best in Australia. It's pretty incredible, really. It is incredible. And that's why he was as good as he was when I raced against him. But it really did show me how big our bonfire is. And to try and, you know, to try and put it out a little bit to be able to live normally. Yeah. And to be able to win that race at 49 years old. God, it's amazing how, how much it still burns. Yeah. Because I can't tell you how, at 200 miles an hour, and throwing it into these corners, and having no respect for your safety at all. At 49 years old, I can't mind. It really did show me why he was struggling uh, six years ago when I talked to him. Yeah. No wonder he was struggling. If he could still win the best in Australia now, at 49. He's still got, he's still he's got still that. Got that. <laughs> yeah. Still got a bonfire in him. Yeah. 
and um, you know. And you think you might have it? Yeah, well, still, I do, I do, yeah. and that's why it's difficult. You know, that's why it's difficult to, uh, um, to to cope with it. But you know, is the buzz of you know playing a gig like an amazing gig? Mm. Is that does that satisfy you? Enough. We did a, a big festival a couple of weeks ago called Hellfest in northwest France, and there, there must have been about thirty thousand in front of the stage. And at that level, um, it 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 does it does uh, uh, replace that uh, that kind of buzz. So, yeah. Because it's that level of expectation, um, that level of people. You know, I raced in front of hundreds of thousands of people, and when you when you do your thing. You, uh, and, and uh, as part of the show, in front of such an audience, that that also uh, is, you can't un- underestimate. That's what gives you the buzz. Yeah. And playing in front of 200 people at Nottingham Rock City, or whatever 200 capacity venue uh, of that size, um, it's 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 not the party that used to entertain up. You know. Um, and then we were supported Deep Purple and Blackstone Cheering. Um, and we did calling festival with Aerosmith. Um, um, as soon as you go up to that kind of five to ten thousand people, then then yeah, yeah, it does. It does yeah, because yeah. you've had like, if you look at your life, like in terms of the jobs you've done, you've had pretty much like every boy's <laughs> dream. Really, haven't you? Like you know, you you've won world championships. Um, you've won world championships riding motorbikes, mm. and then you're a rock star. That's <laughs> quite a. It's quite cool, isn't it? Really, like you couldn't have asked for a. Yeah. To be able to have done both things, I was passionate about when I was a kid. Um, I've been lucky. I was only I was only really introduced to two things that, that I was really passionate about. I was riding motorbikes and playing, playing the piano, and entertaining really. Yeah. Um, and I've been able to do both. Um, to a really incredible level, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's all about managing the emotions along with it. Yeah, you know. Uh, a bit lost. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like it, doesn't it? I mean, you know, the, the other twist of it all was, was meeting Katie Mellow through yeah. the whole thing. I mean, that was a weird thing. I, I took my mum to a show and her piano player's a big bike fan, recognised me in the crowd. I was injured with this. I, I was meant to be racing, but I wasn't. So I was at the gig and he invited me back. And we met. I said to the piano player, I took him back on the back of a bike to say thanks for the gig. Katie said, oh, I want to do that. And that's how that all started. Right, yeah. You know, um, and, um, and then... Subsequently, I didn't realise that this was going to retire me, and it did. Uh, when I had the screws out, and at that point in time, me and Kate were dating um, quite seriously. Um, and in that really kind of difficult moment, you know, whoever was at the side of me at that point in time, that uh, that, that, that really kind of like was uh, was a pillar of strength, like you know. So, yeah, that must have been w- quite a lot for her to take on, because you must have been pretty a bit, heartbroken. A bit, a bit, but um, <laughs> when I first met her. Mm. She'd just come out of hospital. She'd had a break, full-on breakdown. I did see that when I was researching yesterday, and it was kind of one of those things. It's like, do I? Because I think there's a something interesting to ask you, in, you know, in there about supporting the people. That's it. That, but That's it. I didn't know whether it was too mind. sort of, you know. Don't mind. Don't well. mind. So I didn't know I was going to have to go and retire, and for those three months, you know, when I first met Kate and I got the screws and all the rest of it. Um, uh, I'd met her and, and, and she was she was in a real bad way at the time. Um, and my outlook in life and my sportsman competitiveness and all the rest of it was like, come on, love. Yeah, yeah. Let's get on with this. Um, and, uh, and and supported her with it all. Um, and then she repaid the, the favor. I didn't know she was going to have to, but yeah. she repaid the favor when that happened. So that's why um, that's why we kind of quickly got together seriously. We were married in eight, 18 months. And, um, but it was literally through the through, through the two emotions of, of, of going through a pretty difficult times, you know, together. So, mm. um, and then you know, but the the, the 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 issue is a little bit 
when when we were talking about game mode, we were both very very worried that where we'd gone to, and we knew we had to recover quite a lot. Who we were going to be when we come out the other side? Right. So we, we were both worried that um, would the people, would the would the personality that we were going to have to recover from, because um, when you go to such a dark place. Uh, and you, and you lose uh, on my side. Lose who I was. Yeah. Because all I knew was riding motorcycles and going to a track and being in that circus. That, and that's who I was. That's who I, everybody looked at me as. Uh, and it was like taking your Krypton out of you. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know who I was going to. I knew I wanted to try music out. I uh, try a new career for myself. But, uh, but I didn't know who that person was going to turn into. Yeah. And whether she liked that guy again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew she liked the guy that was supporting her for the three months when she first met me, and I was, I didn't, you know, everything was unky dory still. And, you know, I was like, come on, get your training, someone going running, we're doing this, we're doing that. And, and, and she was, you know, she t- tagged onto the back of that. Um, but, um, so that, that was an interesting kind of like um, um, personal journey. And luckily, six years married in September, it looks like. We've kind of navigated it together and uh, and still stayed very strong because we understand each other a lot. Yeah, when you have that sort of experience with someone so soon in a in a relationship, whether that's a friendship or a, like a romantic relationship, I guess that you know you you learn a lot about someone, don't you? When they're you do vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, and then there's the vulnerability. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, lemonade. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it is that vulnerability of, um, uh, but when you're vulnerable, you see, you've got to be honest. Because when you know, some, when some people are vulnerable, they, um, uh, they, it's they, they have the push away kind of uh, reaction to it. Want to be alone, they're yeah. embarrassed because of the situation, um, and they, and they, and they find it even more embarrassing to uh, to ask or feel like they need help. Through it all, and that's when it can get really dark. Mm. Because if you do isolate yourself because of the situation that you're in, um, you, there is strength in numbers. Yeah. But sometimes it's uh, it's not easy. It's not easy because you you know you, everybody sometimes just realize that they, they think that um, they're not going to understand. And also, when you're being quite fortunate in your life and you're going through a tough patch. You think, how are they going to understand that I'm going through a shit time with my million pound house and my car and, yeah. me, the, and me, me, you know what I mean? But you see it all the time, don't you, when, you know, uh, you know, you see it with like uh, Robin Williams or something, you know, when, you know, Robin Williams committed suicide and everyone goes, oh yeah, but, you know, he had a great life and yep. they're not thinking about, you know, what's yeah. going the on. chemicals in your head. Yeah. And it's all relative. No matter what we've got, and and I think um, you know on on the social media front and all the rest of it, this like you know uh, this kind of like um, uh, ambition to, to have a certain lifestyle and a certain kind of like way of, of living, um, it, it's even more damaging these days because uh, we feel that you know when when you're really living life, you've got a bit of a you've got a yacht and you've got a shit up car and you've got a bird that looks like that or a car that you know is such a, a certain model. Um, whatever it may be, it's all quite materialistic stuff, isn't it? That we're yeah. all kind of portraying that that's the idealistic way of, of being. Um, but unfortunately, if, if, if you've not had it, that's what people obviously aspire to have and, yeah. and crave to have when they don't have the knowledge that it's not, that's not, that's not, not everything. everything yeah. no, it doesn't, no. doesn't fill, it doesn't fill you up. And, no, yeah. and when you try and kind of like and when you try and kind of like maybe say that to people that you can see that that's an issue for them, oh, it's all right for you. Yeah. Get your house, get your car, this is whatever, you know. Um, uh, but um, yeah, it's very difficult to kind of get that message across with they've got that kind of inspir- uh, you know, aspirations to it, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's not easy, is it? <laughs> it's, not e- it's not easy to keep a balance. Yeah. It's not easy to keep a balance. Um, to keep a balance of reality or what is most important when opportunities arise that takes reality to another level. 
when you're world champion, two-time world champion, because you, you were, you know, you were living the, living the dream, living the dream yeah. as it were. Yeah. Oh, I guess you said you, you know, you're, you, 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 had, you still had your schoolmates and stuff that sort of kept you grounded. Yeah. But was it difficult to not let it go to your head and um, a little bit? Not, not as in a, not as in a change in the personality side of it. Um, I just, I mainly just loved because uh, I knew I could achieve what I wanted to achieve. That, that was a, that was the most exciting thing. It wasn't because I could afford a car. Right. It wasn't because I could afford a nice house. It wasn't because I could pull nicer girls than I used to be able to do at school <laughs> when I was spotty and playing piano. Although that's always a bonus. <laughs> it is a bonus. It's all a bonus. <laughs> But, but I realised um, that those things only came because of. Yeah. Um, and the main drive was still the original main drive of wanting to win. Um, and, I, and I think that's what uh, that's what saved me from, from from changing. But yeah, you do see it a lot. As soon as you as soon as some people earn a few quid, um, and they realise that those doors open, they stay in the other rooms. And even though I could see those doors were open and all the rest of it, I used to like coming through my you know, mum's front door and my grand's front door and sitting and have a cup of tea and talking about normal stuff still. Yeah. Um, I think maybe because I was introduced to racing completely by the off chance with my mum's new boyfriend that she met. If she hadn't met that new boyfriend when I was eight years, nine years old, I would not know what a motorbike was. Uh, and I knew I was pretty competitive at that time. But you see, once you met him and he bought me a motorbike, um, uh, I'd I, I found the best thing ever for who I, my personality was. Yeah. You know, I used to win at the sports day stuff a bit. You know, I was that kind of kid. Just to look, you know, I was just competitive and loved it. But riding a motorbike and going as fast as you really want to riding a motorcycle track and crashing and injuries, it was just like right on my street. This yeah, is, yeah. It just fed it fed exactly what I wanted it for, to feed um, as a personality thing but he wasn't around after 16 and I had a whole career without him there so I think what helped me grounded as well was every time I came home and he, he wasn't around and it was just my mom and my grand and my brother and that and um, it, it wasn't really talked about I didn't come home and I'd got like that dad going oh that race you know what, what you know the paddock or just mm. there was no bike chat at all because one couldn't stand it right really no she couldn't stand it she couldn't stand it I mean, imagine watching your son going down at 20 miles an hour I suppose yeah visiting yeah. your son in hospital <laughs> yeah it's Looking not to survive on a couple of occasions yeah it's not it's not really the gig that your mum wants no it? it's not is it no. I suppose no um, so I, I think that as well changed because uh, I, I was always a bit different in the paddock You'd always got these lads where the dads had started them and the dads are still there. Yeah. The dads maybe used to race. And that's all they knew. That's all they... Because it is a bit of a travelling circus. It's a bit of a gypsy lifestyle. Yeah. It's a small paddock with the same people. With when, cliques of... Yeah. Cliques of people. I've just been to Brands Hatch for the British Superbike Championship. I didn't, I've not been for 15 years to the British Superbike Championship. It's the same managers, engineers. It's the same circus. Yeah. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. Um, but because my, my introduction to it, uh, and I was just on my own a bit with it, and the family that really didn't like it, um, I was a bit of an outsider as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a confessor, you know. Um, I, think that, I think that helped a, a little bit, actually, thinking about it. Because when I finished racing, my life away from the racetrack wasn't that different. Right. There was only me devastated by it. Yeah, Everybody you didn't have everyone else around you. That's everyone else was crying with joy. Yeah. I wasn't doing it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, that might have helped a bit. Because, like, if I'd have had a dad right into it and blah, 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 and then I had to retire and my dad's moping about, we know yeah. to do it a weekend now because I'm not, you know. Yeah, you had no one to, to let down in a way by retiring. No. It wasn't, you no. weren't disappointing anybody. No. Not at all. That was a positive, which at the first pissed me off. Yeah. Because I wanted somebody to be really pissed off with me. Right. But every round me was <laughs> <No, I> <laughs> <laughs> celebrating the, the occasion. <laughs> and, uh, 
yeah, I remember being quite, um, yeah, but quite frustrated by that, that that fact. But again, that kind of uh, it just kind of put reality into yeah. check of it again, you know, a bit quicker than it should have done. Because if everybody like lived a life of being pissed off by me not racing around me, I'd have been pissed off for longer, you know. I'd have had an excuse too. Yeah. A bit probably. But no one was listening. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, was just, I was just happy about that. Yeah. So I thought, well. <laughs> Oh, this is the environment, I better get on with it. And that's yeah. probably why it pushed me into music so much. Um, so quickly. Yeah, you talk about, you, you sort of entered mode bike racing on your own in a, in a way. Going into music, because I, I imagine, and just from the stuff I've read, there's a lot of like, because of the fact that you're married to Katie, people assume that she's given you a, a leg up, which I know, she hasn't because you just wanted to do it. Is that? Do you think that's a similar? That comes from that, or you just just didn't want to be right? It was always going to be the case. Being married to Katie Mello was a pain in the ass when I wanted to be trying to be a professional musician. Being an ex-motorcycle world champion to world champion was a pain in the ass trying to be a, 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 a musician. Right. I picked two things in life that's going to make it very very difficult <laughs> to be a professional musician. <laughs> but you go out on stage. And you do your thing. Yeah. They can't deny that. No. And they can't stop that. And they can't stop you writing a song. Um, and they can't stop you writing a song that connects with people. Um, and that's why it's always about the songs. And if you really concentrate on that and focus on the songs, um, it doesn't matter what you do then. You know? Yeah. There's been a couple of occasions where different sportsmen have done different things. I think uh, Julio Iglesias was a, fo uh, a goalkeeper of Real Madrid. Mm. And when you hear about things like that and the, and the level that he got to, I mean, you would never know he was a sportsman before no. because of his uh, music. Um, and, and I think there's a, obviously we were just on before Johnny Depp in the uh, Hollywood Vampires at the festival just gone. Yeah. And he was a musician before he was an actor and he actually didn't want to be an actor, he wanted to be a musician. And he's got that stigma. Yeah. Yeah, he does actually, yeah. He wears his guitar very low. <laughs> he does very low. He's very low. <laughs> you do that, think like, that might be pull up the strap it, of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just might be combating that thing, <laughs> yeah. you know? You know, uh, you know, please look at me as a musician. Look how low I can get my guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's too low. Right? <laughs> I can't watch it. I'm like, but, oh, pull it up. You know, just to... He's good. He's... Alice Cooper and Joe Perry play with him. Yeah. They wouldn't say yes to no. some numpty. Yeah, even if course. he is a massive movie star, they're not going to muck about exactly. if someone can't. Yeah, but he's still got it. Yeah, and I think uh, the level of the Johnny Depp is on a fame front. It just shows you that um, it's it's even more difficult depending on how established you are. I mean, yes, I was a liberal motorcycle world champion, but oh, Jesus Christ, that's niche. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, I can walk around Barnes and there's probably you're the first, but it was your dad, sorry. Yeah. Your dad's probably the first person to hear this <laughs> shit. So and that's because we like racing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, imagine Johnny Depp. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't be sat here now, would we? We'd have a lot of photographers and all the rest of it, you know. And, you know, joking apart, Yeah. my bridge was a lot, lot smaller to try and cross to get credit as doing something else. As, uh, as, as a Johnny Depp would. In fact, I think Johnny Depp, the size he has, I'm not sure if he'd, uh, he'd, uh, he'd, ever, he'd ever be looked upon as just a musician and a guitarist. No. But he's just a guitar, I say just, he's a guitarist, a great guitarist. But you see, I'm a front man. Yeah. That's different. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's almost easier for, for it's not easy, but it's, you know, if you're not the, the front and center guy, yeah. you can sort of, sink into the background exactly. a bit, do your thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas you have got, you're putting yourself out there. Big time, yeah. That's the difference with it. I mean, if I, you know, if I really wanted to just play my piano and all the rest of it and get really, really good, I could just be the piano player for Moises and do some other gigs. But it's not my genre. It, just playing the piano um, doesn't cut it for me. I do enjoy being the front man and singing, you know. So that's why I chose to do that, but, but yeah, the, 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 these are the hurdles that you've uh, you've obviously got to get across. Yeah. 
I'm not sure if we'd still be married if we tour together. <laughs> <laughs> It'd also be a very different gig, wouldn't it? Oh, big time, big time, yeah. big time. But yeah. it's nice, that, because there's yeah. no competition. Mm. You know, I, I didn't realise it for a while, but I, I realised when everybody said, oh, did, you know, Katie helped you out, Katie helped you out, it's Katie helped you out. Because um, if, I had an, if I had a quiz for everybody that said, uh, do you miss racing? Right. And uh, has Katie helped you out in the music I'm industry? I'm trying to think now if I've yeah. asked this. <laughs> no, you haven't, you haven't. Those two, and those two are, you know. Um, but it, it's it's a good it, it's a good judge of 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 the of, of what people are thinking. Yeah. And and it and it, it allows me when I'm asked all those questions quite a lot. It allows me to manoeuvre around it because I know what people are thinking. Yeah. So it's an advantage for me by being asked those difficult questions, even though they're not easy questions to be asked, um, that I can kind of uh, make sure that I'm doing things to counteract them. I saw a lot of articles about you doing a land speed record attempt. Yeah. But I didn't see any of you actually <laughs> doing it yet. <laughs> I didn't know if you, is, that, is that still a thing? Is that still it, on? It, it is still a thing, I think. Um, as soon as I retired from racing, there was uh, this private team that were building a bike with a Rolls Royce helicopter engine in it, and they wanted to be the first person to go over 400 miles an hour on a motorcycle. And as soon as I retired from racing, I didn't have to use my wrist because you could use a foot throttle right. on it. Because it's kind of like a car, but yeah. with two wheels, isn't it? Exactly. Kind of like you sat down. Long pod thing. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that sounds right up my street. That'll keep uh, that'll keep a little bit of a uh, uh, fire. Um, yeah. Oh, suppressing a bit of that fire. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, but it's it's taken a few turns, twists and turns, because of the finances of actually uh, funding the project uh, along the way. Right. And like, I went there, got measured up, got the seat measured up, did all the thing. Um, and I could see that it was a, a, it was a bit of a, a bit of a homegrown project. Yeah. Um, These things usually are, though, aren't they? Yeah. They're usually, some bloke in a shed. In a shed, like, it is. Yeah, like, literally. Okay, I'm yeah. going to make something go really it, fast. It's literally that. And, and it got like two or three meetings down the line. I went, right, lads. You want me to ride it? Yeah, we want to ride. Right, cool. Don't ring me up again. Until you want me to ride it. Until it's ready to test. Right. And I'm ready to put my helmet on and get in it. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of what's happened. That's why it's kind of been uh, a little bit quiet on, on the um, um, on any kind of progress or, or updates. Yeah. Um, uh, but I do believe that the, the, they have, they've got the engine uh, uh, ready from the dyno, ready to put in the chassis. Right. I know they've got the chassis all done because I've sat in it and sat in the seat and, and all the rest of it. Um, and I haven't heard anything for a couple of months, which has uh, been a, a bit of a surprise because uh, the car did a test on, on the news not long ago because they're going up to a thousand mile an hour, aren't they, the car? Yeah. Uh, um, and um, they, they, they rang me up that to look at that uh, and with not much update again. Um, so we'll see. But the problem is, again, you know, this is five, oh, a good five, six years ago now when I first sat down with them. And... Um, my brain was used to um, processing information at 200 miles an hour every weekend, and I've lived in London now for eight years, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's about three and a half mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, because th there is a level of that as well, right? Fitness to go 400 miles an hour when they first asked me to, it was, didn't, it wasn't even a thing. Like, yeah, as long as it's stable. And the track and the salt flats are flat, nice and smooth. It wouldn't bother me at all, that at all. But you know, five years on, I'm five years older, and not right, not ridden at all. And I know that um, even getting back on a proper motorcycle again on a track uh, would be a bit of a shocker again, because you, you do get used to, let's say, uh, processing it. So. Uh, if they rang up and said, James, the bike's ready, we're ready to test. We're doing it next week. <laughs> doing it next week. Yeah. Um, it, I'd be like, phew, because I have to tap into that again. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the more, more the years that go on that I'm not riding for and all the rest of it, it'd just be more and more difficult to tap back into it. 
because as a as a um, uh, as a, as a process of, of, of recovery, I, I've tended to keep myself away from doing stuff like that, mm. to, to not miss being that way and having those kicks. Um, but if they did ring up and say, right, next week we're testing, uh, I'd do it. I'd do it. Uh, but I've not really mentioned it much because obviously my family would be going berserk, you know. <laughs> and the missus would go berserk, you know. It, it is a bit dodgy like. But. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see if that kind of comes off. But it's still, it's not. It's definitely not a no. Right. Um, and now you've mentioned it again. Actually, I'll, uh, I might, uh, <laughs> might, might drop yeah, him an email. Might, yeah. see what's going on. <laughs> Wasn't Guy Martin supposed to be doing something like that as he well? He did, and he, he did the test. Um, but the big, one of the biggest issues for all line speed records is Bonneville's climate's changed so much. Um, it's not. It's it's raining quite frequently really? through the summer, so the lake's not drying out enough for the salt to solidify. So it's a bit sort of mushy, mushy and yeah, groupy. Yeah. Right. And he he did the test. Well, he crashed. Not massively, yeah. but massively enough for it to be a problem. And through the night, because it's just off the open road, you know, where Bonneville Salt Flats. Is it? Some guys have been on there. I in imagine a car. it's just been like a big sort of desert. Out of the way. I and mean, they've done it on Top Gear, haven't they? But yeah. But there is the freeway, like literally next to it. <laughs> and some guys on the car just been on, done some donuts. They'd not checked the track. And he hit the berm of the car ah. door. And that, when, when I heard about that, and that was <laughs> that's a proper factory team, yeah. Guy Martin, because the, the production company that does the Guy Martin stuff does the MotoGP stuff. So oh, all really? the TV company and all the rest of it, I, I know really well. So that's why I know the full story. Ah. And I'm thinking that's a full factory effort. Yeah. The fact that no one's walked the track. <laughs> It's to slightly, check, slightly to check there's no <laughs> or lumps and bumps. When, and then you're doing it with a I'm couple of loads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'll be, uh, if they do rig up, I'll certainly be checking the track before I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go down it. So there you have it, James Tozen. My thanks to James for doing the show and my thanks to you, the listener, for joining me this week. I do hope you come back next time, which will be on schedule as opposed to this week, when I will be having another interesting chat, this time with American journalist and author David Nywert. Uh, remember to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, follow us on Spotify, go and follow us on Instagram at the last line podcast to keep up to date with the shows going on and go and chuck us some money at patreon.com forward slash the last line episode seven done. Um, my name is James Alvarn and this is the last line.